One of my clients passed away. And thankfully, we did the work that we did. Dad, you made your great journey, and now it's time for me to make my big, great journey. Anyway, I said, hey, Dad, why don't we go fly a helicopter? He's like, what? Sacrifice, so therefore you can show them a better example. And my father recalls being told by his older sister, my aunt, hey, you're two years old. You need to learn how to play dead at two years old. When you, yes, you, when you think about what a first generation cash flow faith-based millionaire does on a daily basis, what do you think about? Let me ask you another question. If you had the chance to be a fly on the wall and see the day-to-day -day habits and see the everyday battles of a faith-based cash flow first generation millionaire, what do you think you would see? What do you think you would observe? Well, because I want to help you become that faith-based first generation cash flow millionaire, I'm going to break down three things that faith-based millionaires do every single day in this episode of the Seven Fear Squad happening in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping now. I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Was fighting in them chinches. Now I'm making seven figures like What's cracking everybody? Money smart guy Matt Zapala hailing to you from correct Dallas, Texas. Our first official episode here in Dallas, Texas. We are fishing now, relocated from Chicago, Illinois, now to Dallas, Texas here. And uh, I'll tell you this, 38 years, thank you so much, Chicago. You've been my home. Outside of the eight years I spent in the Marines, Chicago, you've been my home. So thank you for the memories. You are a large part of who I am. My friends, my family is still back there. You're still very much part of my family, even though I'm in Dallas, Texas. But nevertheless, we are here now in this part of the country. Excited to be here, excited for the opportunities here. And in the midst of unpacking, we grounded for a couple days. And then we left for Shelbyville, Tennessee. And a cool thing, my sister is also now there in Nashville, relocated from LA to now Tennessee. So I got to see her. And we got to see the grand reopening of one of our investments, which is Uncle Nearest's Whiskey. And uh, so excited to see Fawn Weaver and her husband out there lead this charge. Fastest growing whiskey company in America. Black owned business. Board is 100% multicultural, women led. It's exciting to see this happening there in Shelbyville is also to be part of this entrepreneurial story coming alive here in America in spite of the pandemic and the lockdowns. And by the way, if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We officially crossed over 100,000 subs a couple weeks ago and we're marching now on our way to 150,000 subs here on our YouTube channel. And to quickly remind you of our promise, once we hit 150,000 subs, we are donating $5,000 to a church or a nonprofit that you help us nominate. We're gonna be creating a poll here pretty soon so we want to get to 150,000 subs. So therefore, the Seven Fears Squad YouTube channel can donate $5,000 to a local church or charity that you and I crowdsource together, figure out who that is, who that lucky uh, nonprofit or church is once we hit 150,000 subs. So please subscribe and share our videos. And one last thing before we get going, this is being uploaded on Father's Day. So I want to wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day. Continue to lead strong families to build strong homes. To build strong homes, build strong communities, build strong communities, build strong cities, strong cities, build strong states, and strong states, build strong countries. So fathers, let's lead the way. Happy Father's Day. Now, as I said before, I'm going to be breaking down in this episode three things that first generation cash flow, Bible-based, faith-based millionaires do on a day-to-day -day basis and some of the things potentially you can adopt to as well. But before we get going, you know, I'm a big guy of affirmations. And if you're watching this episode and you're here at this point, please put it in the comment section below. If you want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, put this down in the comment section below that I will become a first generation cash flow millionaire in the comment section below. So without further ado, let's get right into today's episode. Now, if you were with us in December, you remember this episode of the three daily habits that made me a millionaire. And that was during our Vlogmas challenge where we uploaded an episode every day from the 1st of December all the way to the 24th. Of December. And what we noticed from our YouTube subscribers and our building and growing YouTube community here of the Seven Figure Squad, that many of you just don't want to make money just for the sake of making money. That you just don't want to be a millionaire simply for the fact of being a millionaire. Many of you prefer to be faith-based millionaires. Well, here are three more daily habits that I do every single day, which actually we created a YouTube video a couple years ago called Winning the Everyday Battle. Implement these into your life and watch your life continue to unfold and change for the better. Now, let's get into number one, serve. When you go about your business, when you go about your day, you serve. Serve the people around you. You know, about three weeks ago, we did this interview with Daniel Kwok of the Kwok Brothers YouTube channel. 
And he says something pretty profound of one of the things that Jesus did to his disciples, which was washing their feet, which was an act at that time when you wash somebody's feet is probably one of the lowest of lowest things you can do to anybody to touch somebody's feet, let alone wash their feet. And yet Jesus washed his disciples feet, which led an example saying, listen, you're no better than anybody next to you, your man, the woman next to you for them to be able to say, you know what? I am going to be in a position to not only help you, but also wash your feet. Let me create this act of service to make sure that if you're walking around muddy, that we can still have the ability to have a conversation or provide a service or a product that helps you wash your feet to keep your feet clean. So therefore you can go about your business better than you were before somebody had met you in your business or offering of your product or service. And another reminder of this is when I entered the life insurance industry because selfishly and actually urgently, I got involved in the life insurance business because I needed to make a paycheck right away. And this was in 1999 after leaving the Marine Corps. And I didn't realize that when I did my business by going about business, it wasn't just about the commissions because that's why I talk about selfishly. I just did it to make a paycheck. I need to get paid on the first and the 15th, just like I did in the military. I was desperate. I was a single father. I had to provide for my kids. So I don't need to make sure that uh, I was making a paycheck, but it wasn't until a couple years later, a few years later that I realized the power of what I was doing by getting involved in the life insurance industry and realizing the nobility of it. Cause sadly, a few years later, one of my clients passed away and thankfully we did the work that we did because I opened up the client's folder. The daughter reached out to me. I opened up the client's folder, got the policy numbers, called the insurance companies and uh, make a long story short. I showed up to the funeral with three envelopes in my, uh, in my jacket. And at the funeral, I handed the daughter a title to a paid off house. I handed the daughter also the death benefit of a life insurance policy. And also I handed the daughter a inherited IRA of a retirement account. They, we discovered that they forgot, the clients forgot about that when they passed away, but we discovered it. We were able to transfer the IRA in the name of the daughter. And the daughter was just crying and weeping there, just talking about uh, how good uh, her parents were to her and that she didn't want any of her parents' money. I said, you know what? It wasn't your decision. It was your parents' decision. And to make a long story short, guys, it was something that I realized that by serving her in her needs and serving her in a career and a profession that gives back to people in a massive, massive way, I realized at that moment the power of what I do for a business as an entrepreneur is here to serve our clients in a community. And when you do that, what a massive amount of return that provides you as an entrepreneur knowing that you're putting a lot of goodwill out there because you're operating from that position. The second one is to fight. Fight for your friends and family. Just don't go about your business lackadaisical. Fight and have purpose behind what you do. Let me tell you about the story about my father. My father grew up in the Philippines during World War II. I don't know my mother. We don't know how she died. Nobody in our family wants to talk about how she died. We'll probably uh, never know how our grandmother passed away during World War II when the Japanese invasion came in and the bombing in Manila came in and the Japanese soldiers were uh, we're, we're basically killing and murdering everybody in the streets. And my father recalls being told by his older sister, my aunt, hey, you're two years old. You need to learn how to play dead at two years old. Now, how many have kids and your parents out there? How hard is it to tell a two-year-old to be quiet, let alone try to play dead in the streets so therefore they don't get bayoneted by the Japanese soldiers going through the streets? Well, that's what my dad had to do. And when my dad had an opportunity to come to America because he was a tour guide and he was befriending um, uh, this family that thought, hey, Dell, you know, would you like to come to the United States? My dad said, yeah. So my dad got an opportunity to come to Indiana. I went to Indiana University and uh, made his way up through uh, a college degree and, and got a job at Sears, sweeping docks to becoming a logistics manager. He fought for his family. In spite of all of that, he was able to fight for those he loved and cared about to create a better future for all of us here in the United States of America. And I remember when I first started my business, I got out the military. I first started my business. My dad said, you know what? You're a single father, man. You, you, <laughs> you just need to get a job. You know, you need salary, you need benefits. You need something consistent and safe and secure. You got children to take care of. You can't play business. You need a guaranteed paycheck every couple of weeks. I said, dad, you made your great journey. And now it's time for me to make my big, great journey. I, I believe that every generation has a decisive decision to make. And this right now, being an entrepreneur is mine. So dad, I love what you had to say, but uh, I'm gonna step out my way as a man and do my thing. And I think from a position of love, my father did that. He was kind of scared for me taking on this endeavor of becoming an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you this, for, for many, many years, my father didn't support me as an entrepreneur 
for many years that, uh, that we had uh, family get-togethers and dinner at the house. He said, hey, once you get a job, once you get a job. I remember my father opened up a manila envelope one time. And he was opening up these uh, uh, packages of applications I needed to fill out for the FBI, local law enforcement. Basically, job application get me get me involved to you know, utilize my military experience and my uh, security clearances. I said, Dad, listen, I don't want to do that. I'm an entrepreneur now. I'm in the insurance industry. You should see some of the work I'm doing. He said, yeah, but uh, you're not really making money. He said, yeah, but I'm getting this business started. And it's going to be amazing. And uh, anyway, I ended up buying a house in a neighborhood that we never thought we'd live in. We were earning income that we've never thought we'd make, that type of income that we've only read about in newspapers, saw in magazines. And I remember telling my father, I said, Dad, I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for you. And we had an opportunity to get a company to pay a trip to Hawaii. I said, Dad, what are you doing in December? He goes, nothing. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you want to go to Hawaii? Pack your bags. You're going to Hawaii. I said, where? Hawaii. Anyway, we're in Hawaii. And uh, anyway, we checked into this hotel. And the person says, uh, you have three ways to get to the hotel. It's a 15-minute walk to your room. Or you can take the tram. Or you can take the gondola. How would you like to get to your room? I <laughs> just see the look at my father's face, my mother, they're there. And uh, I found out that on a flight over, my daughters, because it's hard for me to talk to my father. I found out my daughters were talking to my dad because I wanted to ask certain questions of my dad through my daughters. And come to find out my father growing up wanted to be a pilot, but never in a million years with my father being poor, a poor family uh, in the Philippines, uh, bad eyesight. No way in a million years was he ever going to become a pilot. So we were having breakfast and uh, my dad looks at the helicopters uh, next to the flight line next to the diner that we're at. And he's like, hey, why don't we go out and uh, fly a helicopter? <laughs> if he was joking around, right? But I wasn't joking around. Anyway, I said, hey, dad, why don't we go fly a helicopter? He's like, what? <laughs> and uh, we jump on this helicopter and uh, we're flying around Hawaii. We're flying around the the the, the waterfalls are flying to and through this volcano and uh, the helicopter pilot allowed my dad to hold the controls uh, for a moment to give him the feeling of what it means to be a pilot, what it feels like to be a pilot. And my dad said, hey, Matt, come up here. Take one of those pictures. Take one of those pictures while I'm flying this thing. He says, what pictures, Dad? I'm here in the back of the helicopter. He goes, come up here. He goes, I want you to take this picture. What do you call those things? Selfie? <laughs> when I'm taking a selfie in a helicopter flying three, four, five hundred feet above volcanoes and waterfalls in Hawaii. So when I'm thinking about fighting, that's what we fight for. We fight for them. We fight for our family. We fight for those we love and care about. We fight for those to therefore create a better opportunity to not only just provide a roof over your head and food on the table. That's the bare minimum. But fight, man, to provide a life, to create a purpose, to create an incentive for the next generation to want to do something greater to themselves. So I want to know. Based on you, if you're still watching this video, comment below. I'm fighting for those I love. I'm fighting for those I love. I'm fighting for those at home. Put in the comment section below. I want to know who's fighting for those who you really love and care about. Third one is the sacrifice. Yes, sacrifice. You sacrifice so therefore you can show somebody a better way. Now, probably one of the most uncomfortable things for me to talk about, but I want to be transparent and authentic to you, is I spent my entire 30s repaying the mistakes of my 20s. Here's what I mean. I made the poor decision of getting married too soon, of being entangled in wrong relationships, being a single father, three kids through it, and having the sad reality of a separated family where the children had to deal with both sides of the family, different households, different roof, different philosophies, different talks, different mindsets, versus them being unified under one value and one principle. It was always division, division, division. So my kids would leave my house to go to the mom's house. And division, 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 sad part about it. And I'm doing my very best to lead my family in a way that they're serving and they're fighting and they're sacrificing for the family. Well, the other side of the family wasn't thinking that way. Now, with that being said, good people, obviously the other sides of the family to my children, my three older children, just not wired the way I was wired. And when I'm going about talking to my children about making sure you pick the right partner, make sure you date the right person, make sure you understand the values and principles, what they stand for, what they're about, because that is so important, because I picked wrong. I picked differently. I picked with the wrong emotion, okay? I think some of you may relate to what I'm discussing, because what may be nice on the outside, you really gotta seek 
what's in on the inside of the person, a person that you choose to build a life with, have a relationship, let alone have kids with. And because I made that mistake, I spent my entire 30s financially and emotionally and spiritually repaying the mistakes of my 20s. I remember my son was born, uh, Jordan, our youngest, and I brought my three older kids downstairs. I said, okay, you know, smooch, smooch, kiss your brother, meet your brother, come downstairs, let's have a conversation. And I told my kids at the time, I was, listen, I apologize for the mistakes I've made as a father, but I'm doing my very best right now to give you opportunities for the future because you play your cards right, you guys are gonna be multimillionaires. You don't play your cards right, you're not gonna be multimillionaires because that's the way we've designed our family trust. That you just can't sit around at home when I die and pass away and move on. Uh, you just can't sit home and collect money from a trust fund. You have to be active. You have to be doing something. And uh, But at the same time, too, I told my kids, if you play your cards right, you guys are going to be wealthy. Um, but with that being said, I want you to know that you cannot play the jealousy and envy card when it comes to your brother. Because he's probably going to have access to more information and opportunities and education, iPads and technology that you had when you were four or five years old because... I was in a much different financial position then than I am today. So you cannot play that jealousy or an envy card. What you can do is say, hey, Dad, I got this idea. I got this opportunity. What can I do about it? Can I propose to your business plan? Sure. I'm all ears. I want to support you and all that I can if it makes sense and if it makes money. But the bottom line I'm saying is this. Sacrifice so therefore you can show them a better example to learn from your mistakes. So therefore, people don't have to repeat your mistakes. You know, wisdom is not only learning from your mistake, but wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others. Because I'm doing all this to make sure our next generation has a better head start based on whatever they feel that God's purposed in their lives to do that. And they're going to need some financial backing to do that. And guess who's going to help provide that financial backing to do that? Yours truly. Because I remember my three jobs when I started my business when I left the Marine Corps. I was a Jiffy Lube hood technician, I was a YMC lifeguard, and I was an Olive Garden server. But I wasn't planning for the short term. I wasn't just saying, oh, I'm just taking these jobs just to take a job just to make an immediate paycheck, and that's it. These jobs were helping me fund and finance and push the bills off at bay for a minute, so therefore I can focus in on launching my business in the life insurance industry. But once I started making more money part-time in my business than I did in my full-time job, having a little bit of sacrifice away from a lot of uh, family parties, sadly, and birthday parties, but to get this launched off up the ground, I needed to do that. Why? Because nobody was going to give me what I felt I deserved. You know, in Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, God has given us the power to create wealth. Notice the scripture doesn't say, I've given you wealth and just lands on your lap and do nothing about it to earn it, right? He's given us the power to create wealth. So you and I have to do something with that power. And with that power, sometimes comes great sacrifice. And part of that sacrifice was weeding out the people that were dragging me down. You know, think about this. If you want to become a first generation faith-based cash flow millionaire, ask yourself this question. How many people around you did you grow up with were actually that? How many of them were actually millionaires? Legally, how many of them were millionaires? How many were even making half a million bucks? So if the majority of the people that you grew up with were making minimum wage or just surviving, yet you want to become a first generation cash flow faith-based millionaire, guess what's starting to happen now? You've got to transform. You've got to change. You've got to sacrifice. I'm not saying you got to forget your friends. I'm just saying you can't hang out with your friends. You just can't have a day-to-day -day conversation about what your daily operations are and running your business and building your dreams because they just won't understand you because you're starting to speak a language that they don't understand. They're going to start saying things like, why sacrifice, man? Fridays, it's weekend, it's 4th of July, it's, it's Saturday. What are you doing? Uh, what are you doing on Friday night? What are you doing on Sundays? That's the Lord's day. But yeah, but the Lord created things for six days before he took a rest. Did you build something? God did. Did you? And I say this all the time. Temporary sacrifice for permanent happiness. Today I will do what others will not to live a life that others cannot. Let me ask you this another question. If it only took you 10, 15, 20 years of your lifetime to set up your generations for multiple generations, would you do it? If it just took you 10, 20 years to sacrifice that bit of time in the whole totality of your life, the 20-year lifespan for you to make your money, for you to establish this financially, to set forth based on values and principles, to set up what the next generation is going to look like. If it took you 5, 10, 20 years to do that, would you do it to set your family up for the next 50, 100 years? Would you do it? If, by the way, if so, put in the section below, I will sacrifice for future generations. 
I will sacrifice for future generations. Put it in the comment section below if that's something you're willing to do. So there it is, three things. Serve, fight, sacrifice. Every single day. This is what I call winning the everyday battle. If you wanna watch this video, click right here to check it out. And also, if you wanna learn the three daily habits that made me a millionaire, check out this video here too as well. And before I let you go, a quick reminder, please help us get to 150,000 subs because I wanna give $5,000 away in the name of the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel to a church or charity that you and I pull together and decide who to give that money to. So please, let's get to 150,000 subs so therefore I can cut that check. That being said, guys, I'm gonna get back to unboxing and organizing and unpacking here in Dallas, Texas. And if you are watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notification be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. That being said, guys, I'm Money Smart Guy here from Dallas, Texas. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.